Hi, I'm Roshana Baldwin, a journalist, a Chicagoan, and a millennial bringing light to everyday stories that matter. I share the type of stories that mainstream media ignores or gets wrong. The news of the neighborhoods, the news that matters. Here is someone you need to know. Jessica Holmes, you're the owner and executive chef for Soul Bariqua Hospitality, and you're a culinary instructor at Washburn Culinary Hospitality Institute here in Chicago in the Inglewood community on the South Side. How are you doing in the midst of COVID-19? Um, I'm really focused on trying to stay safe and stay sane. <laughs> That's my goal right now. So, so far, so good. What have you been doing to keep active and stay in focus and, you know, even engaging with your students because you are, like I mentioned, you know, an instructor at Washburn. So the biggest thing was that we had to move all of our courses online and we did that in a matter of days. And so that was crazy and chaotic and um, a little bit tough. And so we were able to do it and um, kind of like have this learning curve where our students had difficulty with online platforms too. We're dealing with students who want to be hands-on right there in the culinary field. They want to be hands-on. They want to touch things. They want to try things. And now we're on an online database where like they can't touch nothing. They can't really try these things on their own. And so I think it was difficult for them. Um, but I think the biggest difficulty for my students was the uncertainty that came with all of this. So my first couple um, Zoom calls with my students wasn't even about our coursework or any of that. It was about how are you guys doing? Like, how are you guys feeling? How many of you are still employed? Um, a lot, I had like one-on-one -on -one Zoom sessions helping people fill out their unemployment who'd never done this before because, um, you know, our industry took a big hit. And so it was a lot of uncertainty, you know, and they're looking for me for guidance. Like, what do you think is going to happen and what happens next? And I don't have all the answers. I mean, I have some answers, but I think we're all at a state of uncertainty and what happens next. What do you envision the culinary food industry to look like in the near future? Here in Illinois, our shelter in place is supposed to end by the end of the month. Will we ever go back to the normal of sitting down, breaking bread with each other? What, what, do, I don't, yeah, react to that. Yeah, so um, I think that there will be a normal that occurs, but I don't think it would be something that we were used to before COVID-19. So um, I think that our industry has always been very resilient. Um, we've also been one of those recession-proof jobs, right? And so we're still kind of COVID-19 resilient as we are still essential workers and still doing things. It's just the difference in what becomes necessary. So like when the recession hit, um, fine dining establishment weren't as frequented, right? But fast food it increased exponentially. So I think that's what we're seeing now. Yeah, we're not going to go sit at a fine dining restaurant anytime soon, but we're still, you know, going to fast food places. We're still going to grocery stores. We're still doing that. And so what I've been helping my students do is applying for those jobs that are still essential, that are still hiring. So if they are, have been laid off, you know, there's still places hiring in our industry. And so looking more to move into those type of positions for the time being, and maybe for the next couple of years, that might be something that students are going to be looking toward to doing things like that, as opposed to the really chef cushy jobs that all of them are coming into my school to do. You know, I want to run my own restaurant. I want to be an executive chef at one of these high end restaurants. I don't think that's realistic right now. And so I think it's really important for them to understand looking for jobs that kind of not only pay the bills, but kind of help other people is really important right now. Exactly. I'm seeing a lot of Postmates, Uber Eats. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the fine dining restaurants are going to move into that or pivot into that space? Your students are probably still going to, like you said, have to find jobs. Do you see the fine dining restaurants now doing curbside or even just in a near future in a new normal doing a yeah i think i think some of them have already started adapting um but with that being said when i have a uber eats 
or Grubhub or DoorDash or any of those wonderful um, delivery services, we have to understand that not only um, do I not need as many people in my restaurant, right? I don't necessarily need delivery drivers to do that. I don't need a server to do that. I'm not necessarily cleaning my dining room a lot. So some of those jobs are not still not getting filled and those positions are, they're still laid off. And so moving towards this new normal is definitely still gonna impact employment rates and, and people in general. And so I think we need to understand that in addition to the fact that the restaurants are still struggling, even if I'm getting a lot of Uber Eats orders or DoorDash orders, understand that those are companies in and of themselves right. and they make money as well. And for, in order for them to make money, they take some of that money out of the restaurant's pockets. And so we have to understand that there is, while it's a new normal, it's still not extremely profitable for restaurants to move into this realm and do it. Your industry has always essentially practiced sanitation. In fact, isn't it courses on sanitation? Mm -hmm. Is that going to increase? Is that do you see that increasing? Is it been a, is it a shift happening now? Well, now we're doing it even we're trumping it up even more. Well, yeah, I think there's going to be some new protocols that are in place. Um, what we're seeing, and I think um, for Illinois in general, it's kind of beneficial that we're not opening just yet. We are like a foodie capital, um, and so we're seeing what other you know states are doing as they open up their restaurants and kind of going to mimic some of that and change some of that. The National Restaurant Association has already issued out some of um, their new standards, right? So what does it look like? What do restaurants need to do to reopen? Our industry always has had sanitation courses that had to be taken, um, food handler license courses. And so um, I think the personal hygiene aspect of it, washing hands, sanitizing, those type of things have already been embedded into our industry. Now we're gonna learn how to use some of those sanitary guidelines that we use for ourselves and actually um, implement them into using it in, on the facility and using it um, to help our, our patrons, right? And so we'll use some of this new, new things and new way of doing things to kind of impact the overall cleanliness and overall sanitation of the business. What we've seen in other states so far is that if they, are, if they do have dining customers, they're asking them questions when they walk in the door. Have you been exposed? Do you have a fever? Those type of questions. And if they answer yes, they're like, hey, takeout only, right? They don't want them to dine in. In addition, they are um, giving space between um, at least six feet distance between one family that's dining and the other family that's dining. They're not letting people um, have parties over six, right? And so these are things that we're probably going to see, I think, way into towards the end of this year. We won't see any of this change. And so that's something to think when we start implementing what we're doing, um, we're going to see that this is a little bit of a, a a challenge moving forward and we're not going to be dining out as usual it'll be a bit different you are the executive chef and owner for soul but equal hospitality and essentially you are a frontline worker what have you done to keep people informed help out give back how is soul but equal you know providing education helping giving back so, so far, we've just really been um, helping out with doing, um, like dropping off food for the community, um, putting those packets together. Um, we halted all catering business and all of that business that we were doing. Um, we are still manufacturing our product in Whole Foods, Sofrito, so we're still doing that, obviously, as safely as possible. And so those are probably the two biggest things. But I've also, um, me, as well as uh, some of our, my other consultants, have done some work with helping other businesses move to online platforms, right? Um, so whether it's me helping at the Greater Food Depository, they have a training program. I've helped them move online, Growing Home, Windy City Harvest, where now we're really focusing on getting people serve safe, you know, uh, serve safe um, certified and doing that on this new online platform and making sure that they're getting educated so that when it opens or if they're working in a facility that's still servicing the public, they have those credentials and those licenses in which to do so. And so I think that's the biggest impact we've made is keeping those trainings alive and teaching people how to use these platforms like Zoom or like Teams you know, to get on these platforms and understand how to utilize them to the best of their ability. Now, I did come across a live webinar or video of you utilizing and lending your skill set to a nonprofit here in Chicago. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, um, 
and why you decided to do that? (laughs) I've been working with Growing Home for about maybe five, six years. And I've um, developed their professionalism training that they do for their um, students, as well as the serve safe training for them. And so they just asked me, hey, can, do you, how would you feel about helping us out with our fundraiser and doing maybe a healthy food demo? Absolutely. Um, um, so um, I tapped in and did that. It was a wonderful event, was able to raise a lot of money, even though we're not in person. To do that electronically, I thought it was pretty, pretty amazing. And gave people something to do on a Thursday night, right? <laughs> Do you see more of those um, cooking demos taking place online? Do you see yourself doing more of those? What can you do with the basic staples in your house? Because you still, you know, even if we do open up officially or go back to normal in the the near few weeks, people are still not going to run out, like you said, to the restaurants and to the stores. Um, Do you see that as a new normal of you doing more of these Zoom and cooking demos? Yeah, actually, I've been in discussion with other um, not-for-profits, especially in the Inglewood neighborhood, who are looking to kind of create um, a platform where we're doing these demos and we're utilizing, you know, shelf-stable products. Like, it's really wonderful to do what you can do with fresh produce, and obviously it's healthier. But let's be honest, that's not what some of those people in those neighborhoods are getting or have access to. So let's find out how I can make Um, those canned products like corn and beans and make it a little bit different. Um, One of the things that I did last night in my demo was I took our bonzo beans, right? And so what I did was I roasted those bonzo beans with some seasoning and made them a crouton. So I roasted it for a really long time. They start to pop and they get really crunchy. And now instead of going to croutons on your salad, you can season that the way you want. And now you can pop them in your mouth like a snack. Or you can use them on your salad as a crouton as opposed to the cars or the bread that you might not have access to, right? Um, You can be using some of those shelf-stable products to kind of twist and turn and do other things as opposed to just using, you know, like using the corn for just what it is. Maybe we're making a salad out of the corn. Maybe we're putting it in a blender and making it something else like a base or maize to make something else or make a, a empanada or something out of it. Just kind of utilizing those things that we have in our pantries that we know are shelf stable we have access to and kind of doing a little bit more with it because we're going to get bored with what we have we need to kind of mix it up a little bit i'm hearing about the quarantine 15 or the COVID 15 and that is in reference to people are going to come out of here gaining 15 plus pounds any recommendations simplistic recipes do's or don'ts while you're at home is it okay if i let my children that I don't have eat Fruit Loops all day. <laughs> is it okay if I let the husband that I don't have, you know, bring McDonald's home for dinner since, you know, some people don't want to run out to the stores as often and some people want to avoid, um, you know, going to the crowds. What should we do? I think the biggest thing, and that's with any type of um, dieting or any type of just managing what you're doing, moderation. I think what happens is, we're at home, we're watching TV, I need a snack. No, you do not need a snack at the moment, especially if you just ate. Like kind of like really tailoring and using that self-control, not just with you or with my kids. I have to do it all the time. I have three and the kitchen is closed. I will tell them that the refrigerator is closed right now. And maybe block, giving some structure, like we were used to having structure in our everyday lives yeah. and maybe having this is meal time, like they do in school from this time to this time. And then there's nothing and then a snack time and then, you know, kind of putting those parameters and doing things in moderation. But in addition, understand that if you do gain weight and you do snack, it's not the end of the world. We're all dealing with not only this horrible situation that's happening and we're dealing with maybe money loss and not being able to go outside, but that has a very big emotional effect on our, our mental wellness. Exactly. And understand that if you need to every once in a while, eat a pint of ice cream and just wallow in what's happening. It's okay to do that, but just don't do it every night. (laughs) (laughs) Kind of of get yourself and keep that mental wellness okay, because it's really important to kind of keep that in check because what good are you if your body's fit, but your mind is not right. And so that's going to be really important to kind of keep that in balance and understand that it's okay to kind of snack a little bit. I think my biggest tip, get outside. And when I say outside, I'm not telling you to go kick it and go to a party. I'm so saying like, go, go for a walk. Yeah. 
Right, no secret meetup. <laughs> but I'm saying go outside and walk. Um, I've made it a point to make sure that we go outside every day. If it's raining, we're doing a walk around the house. Like I just, having that vitamin D that the sun gives us, having that um, just stretching your legs a little bit, it kind of takes the angst out of what's happening. It gives your kids some time to get, just spread out a little bit. And it's really therapeutic for your, like, your mental wellness, right? Just seeing that sun and knowing that, you know what, one day I will be out at Grant Park enjoying this sun, but right now I am not. And kind of taking that breather. And then it, it, it's walking, so you're getting some sort of movement in those organs and, you know, letting that breathe a little bit. I think that's really, really important just for your health, not even talking about weight, but just your health to kind of do that stuff. So. You mentioned vitamin D. Is there any other beneficial supplements or foods that we should be taking to keep our immune system boosted or just even help protect against, you know, COVID? Well, so I'm not a um, licensed <laughs> anything in that realm. I know that for myself, I've done my own research for me and my family, and I've take I've added a lot of immune boosting items to my list, right? And so we're taking a lot of elderberry. Um, we're doing a little colonial silver and they have it in forms that my kids don't mind eating right my kids don't mind having and so we're doing a lot of that now i think um, the biggest thing to keeping your immune system up is doing those walks and going outside and keeping those organs moving and getting that exercise i think that's the biggest thing to fighting you know keeping your immune system up if you add some other vitamins or things like that i think that's really important just for me i just trying to keep those those regular vitamins, your everyday multivitamins, keeping that regimen going. I think when you're at home, you're like, well, I don't need to take that vitamin. Just like some of us are like, I don't need to brush my teeth. Ain't nobody seeing me. I still think it's good for you to keep those regimens up, right? And, and creating this new normal that we have, right? I make it a point to make sure that even if my kids are staying home during their online lessons, when they wake up, they're going to act like they're going to school. Get up, go brush your teeth, right. go right. wash up. Um, go eat your breakfast and then start your homework, right? And oh, I make them clean their room too because I like clean rooms. Absolutely, but, clean your rooms. Right. It just it helps you focus if you're in a clean and neat space. And so I still do that regimen with them. I still wake them up at the same times because right now it's like, is it day? Is it night? I still wanted to keep that structure for them. I think that was really important. And so keeping that regimen and making sure they're getting those meals, I think it's really important to keeping your immune right. Because I think the other fact is maybe people are on different sleep patterns. And if you're not getting enough rest, that can definitely jeopardize your immune system as well. So I think it's important to make sure you keep some sort of sleep regimen that's kind of normal or as close to normal as possible. I'm going to throw, throw a curveball at you because you, we, talk, we were talking a lot about, about immune system. I know what food, you know, as you, like you say, you're not, you're not a doctor. But okay. what, what, what should, is it okay to eat? French fries to help me uh, keep my immune system. What will help keep my immune system in terms of food-wise boosted? Can I eat an orange every single day? Should I drink lots of water? Would that help? Milk? Did you mention vitamin D? So I'm like, what else? Because you know, I'm a holistic stuff. practitioner. Right. right. <laughs> Um, I, it's the same stuff that we've always been taught, right? It's the same thing that we've been taught since we were in kindergarten and grammar school. Hey, you need to have a balanced diet, right? So you need to have those fruits and vegetables and some protein and all those wonderful things that we were taught when we were kids. Those are the same guidelines that stand, right? So making sure that you're having a balanced diet. So if I'm going to binge on some French fries, you know, throw some bananas in there, right? Maybe okay. afterwards as your snack, as opposed, if you know you, that you binge for lunch, maybe for dinner, making things a little bit healthier, maybe adding a snack that's a little bit healthier. Now I understand some of us, we want to cheat a little bit, right? We want to do some of those things. And I'm not against that. I cheat. I do. I just think that it's a balance to it, right? And so if I'm going to cheat a little bit, adding a little bit of something good inside is going to be important too. So I think it's just a balance. So those basic things, go get some real fruits and vegetables, right? So not canned items. So like those real bananas, real oranges off the shelf, real potatoes, instead of making a lot of processed foods, like having, making sure that you have one of those fresh elements and something that you're eating throughout the day. That is some good tips and good takeaways. And um, as we wrap up, how are you maintaining um, your personal life? I see your daughter here in the, in the end. <laughs> here out in the video. Yes, right how are you maintaining at home being a wife, a mom, 
um, a business owner? I think for me, um, I'm a really, really into structure. And so for me, creating what my new patterns are was really important. And I think the first couple weeks, I was like, what am I doing? What is going on? I think we all kind of were like that. And then I started to build these structures in, right? Organize my day. What does my Monday look like? What does my Tuesday look like? Um, and organizing the day for my kids too. So like, you know, we organize like, so Monday's art day. We do science day on Wednesday. So after they finish their work, we're doing some stuff with me. And so that gives me something to do with them, but it also kind of institutes some structure that they had when they were in school and that I had when I was at work, right? And so I think that was really important for me to kind of maintain my sanity was to kind of do stuff like that. The other thing I think that I had to do was like, yo, you don't have to clean everything today. You know, you're at home and you're like, yo, I'm gonna, oh my God, there's dust over here. And, you know, I, I've been talking about washing these walls. Yeah, that's fine. Space that out. You know, space that out. I've got so many text messages about washing walls. Right. By my circle. Organizing closets that you have. Yeah, like tackle, don't tackle it all in one week. Not even all in one month. Like give yourself, you know, a day a week or maybe two days a week where I'm going to tackle a piece or an item or tackle this. Don't try to do it all at once. It's overwhelming. And then you're going to freak out and, oh, I need to clean this too now. And I think we do that in moderation too. And so I add a little bit of reorganizing and getting things together. Every week I'm adding a little bit in there. I'm not going to do it all at once. We might be here a little while. So I'll have time to do everything I want to do. <laughs> um, and then I promise you this is the last question. Um, I always right. have parents who have children under like the age of 12 babies. Do they understand? How are they coping with it? Do they really understand why we are enduring our shelter in place? And how have you broken that down to them? That this is not a vacation. This is needed. Yes. Yeah, so originally, the kids were like, vacation, yay. And then I think that they started missing their friends, started missing that interaction. And it was important to have a discussion about what this new looks like. Um, and be honest with them. I let them know I don't have the answers. I don't know when this is going to be over. When it first started, I don't know if you're going to go back to school. Now they're not going back to school. And so I found other ways to kind of keep them connected with their friends there, and keep them connected with the outside world, whether that's us doing these walks that we do every day or whether it was like downloading apps and, you know, texting moms and saying, hey, can my kid Zoom your kid? Can, can they do this? Zoom um, dates. Yeah, Zoom day, play dates, as well as oh, Roblox. It's a game one. that um, a kid can play um, with their friends. And so friending their friends on that game is really a game where they're like doing regular stuff, like going to eat and going mm -hmm. to play in the park. It's the same stuff they would do in real, you know, in real life. Now they can do it electronically. And it kind of, it's kind of been beneficial. But having those real conversations about, hey, this is what we're doing. You have to wear a mask now. When I first gave my six-year-old her mask, I think she was a little like, what is going on? And it kind of hit her a little bit. So having a conversation with her in the midst of her breakdown was really important. And I, I'm really honest with my kids, probably, my mom would probably say too much, but I was very honest with what's happening mm -hmm. and how we need to protect their papa, their nana, like all the people that, they're, that they have in their lives. And we're doing this by keeping those masks on and washing our hands and using sanitizer and kind of not seeing them right now and so i think that was really important to have those conversations especially in the beginning and now they can adjust to that new normal that is the distance that we have now and so i think they're kind of getting into the groove of having some sort of distance i will confess though um me and my sister we have let our kids be around each other so they they have definitely we have done play dates with them and our kids are really close in age so that has been really really beneficial that they can connect with their cousins and you know what, as, as, as it, is it, you know, we, we go further and deeper into, you know, the shelter in place, they're like relaxing on things, like, especially if it's a certain amount of group of people, mm -hmm. individuals who know each other, who kind of know each other's history, and you're still, you know, being sanitary, that they're saying that that's okay. Even now, like Mother's Day is coming up. They, they're saying, go give your mom a hug and then leave. But so I think that is social distancing without making, the so the emotional disconnect so kudos to you and your sisters for actually you know keeping a family bond and yeah know, it, sometimes yeah. we had to sneak and do it because my little sister is like 
No. Y'all can't see each other. Those over my mom, my dad, say whatever everybody. So we, we probably did it um very sneakily at times. We didn't want her to know. And then we had two birthdays during that time. And so they can't hang out with their friends. And so all they could do was have their cousin come over. And you can have a sleepover and at least have someone your age and enjoy their company for a little while. Absolutely. Thank you, Jessica Holm. You're the owner and executive chef for Soul Bariqua Hospitality. Thank you for your ministry and keeping us safe in the culinary institute, culinary world. Um, any last thoughts? Give me a last, you're like, you have the last word. Um, stay safe and stay sane. We will get through this. <laughs> That's Thank it. you so much and enjoy your day and get back to your beautiful children. <laughs>